then i got uh, from, i mean uh, repositioned to ems bhubaneswar in 2018 the same passion continued here we started the advanced laparoscopic surgery training center uh, for the first time in the state of odisha then we started the post doctoral fellowship course in minimal access surgery the first of its kind in the state as well in the eastern zone of the uh, country uh, we have already two uh, people have already passed out from that then we started laparoscopic whipples i know professor bipler as we were talking yesterday that uh, from open whipples it uh, goes to laparoscopic whipples then to robotic whipples probably people are now more in favor of robotic whipples and they're coming back to open whipples again so we're coming we are coming back to square one again so that was the team for laparoscopic whipples then came the covid pandemic so i initially started a solo venture for 3 months every week was taking a laparoscopic surgery uh, class uh, for all my uh, residents as well as uh, surgical colleagues it was going on then i roped in uh, faculties from across the country and from abroad so was very happy and uh, lucky to uh, get everybody on to the platform people were happily joining and sharing their wisdom this uh, surgical academia has got a facebook page which has around 808 members from 15 to 17 countries so it is no more just a teaching platform it's almost a surgical educational movement now so in this episode of surgical academia i have got two eminent distinguished guests professor marcus ulgang bukler from heidelberg university heidelberg in germany in fact uh, professor bukler is probably a world authority on pancreatic resection and whipple separation he is the executive director and professor of surgery in heidelberg university in heidelberg germany from 2003 he has been in that uh, same post he is continuing he is the president of several societies in germany and across europe but notable amongst them he was the president of international forum of international hepatopancreatic biliary association from 2006 to 2008 if i go through the cv of uh, professor bukler it it will be a book by itself i have just uh, picked a few points i mean he has been the editor of chief uh, in digestive surgery since 1995 from 2010 he is editor in chief of langenbach's archives of surgery so uh, yesterday when professor bukler silas and me were uh, just planning about today's evening webinar at one point professor bukler jokingly told me manas uh, one of my lecture costs 20000 euros professor bukler i must say your lecture should be costing nothing less less than 20 million euros it is priceless i must be proud enough to introduce this man that who has done more than 4000 whipples operation in his career till now and astounding figure he has published more than 2000 publications with a h index of 140 it is absolutely unbelievable unimaginable he has 95000 citations for his articles more than 100 book chapters and currently the world congress of international uh, hepatopancreatic biliary association he will be delivering the living legend lecture uh, next saturday so in fact jokingly he was telling yesterday that the living legend lecture lecture is just given before uh, death uh, he was talking this to um, just on a joking mode but uh, professor bukler i must say that you should continue you, you are only young man of 65 i wish you continue to operate for another 20 or 25 years you are a boon to mankind so i am so happy and thankful and grateful to you professor bukler for accepting my request to join and share your wisdom with uh, citizens from many countries who are in the audience platform our next speaker is uh, professor silas sikhande is a good friend of mine who has achieved most of the things in a very tender young age he is the deputy director of tata memorial hospital mumbai one of the largest cancer care center in india and one of the best in asian subcontinent as well he is a professor and head of division of cancer surgery and chief of gi and hpb surgical oncology in tms mumbai Professor Silas uh, is the first Asian to be awarded the Kenneth Warren Fellowship of IHPBA. That's a proud thing. It, that was in way back in 
and he was awarded doctor med md degree by the university of heidelberg with excellent grade in january 2006 for his work on pancreatic cancer and chronic pancreatitis he has 250 publications in pubmed with a h index of 35 70 book chapters and largest series of whipple resection from this part of the world in fact last year when i was talking to silas he was telling that manas uh, should i share my 1300 resections how it went off well in fact maybe in a year he must have added another 100 or 150 more i'm pretty sure of it and he has upgraded from uh, open whipples to robotic whipples and uh, he was awarded the prestigious honorary fellowship of american surgical association and uh, It's a proud moment for every Indian that he is the only Indian to be the chairman of scientific committee of IHPBA and is the youngest president of the Indian chapter of IHPBA International Hepatopancreatic Biliary Association. Silas, so I must wish that sooner you become the director of Tata Memorial Hospital and sooner you occupy the post of president of International Hepatopancreatic Biliary Association. It will be a great pleasure for on my part. So. Thank you, Silas, for accepting the request uh, to join and share with Professor Buechler. And uh, in this series, next week, same time, we'll be having Professor Joel Leroy, another world authority on laparoscopic colorectal surgery, an educator, inventor, and a fantastic surgeon. And Professor Armando Melani from Brazil, uh, who is the director of IRCA uh, Latin America. Pro Professor Joel from France and Professor Melani from. Uh, Brazil will be talking on total mesorectal excision exactly same time next week. So thank you very much, and I must uh, welcome all the audience and Professor Buechler and Professor Silas to this platform. And without wasting much time, may I request Professor Silas to go ahead first. And after Professor Silas uh, talk, Professor Buechler will be delivering his talk. Then we'll be having the question answer session. It's over to Silas. The screen and air, everything is yours. Thank you, thank you, Manas, and a real pleasure and privilege to be with everyone today evening. Uh, can I do my sharing because it says that sure. you are presenting? Sure. So I'm stop. I'm 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 stopping sharing. Just one minute. Yeah. Once you stop share. Yeah. yeah. Please. Then... Yeah. I have uh, stopped sharing. Now you can share your screen. Yeah. So I present now. and now i have this here i share are you able to see now uh, did you uh, click on the ah, yes it's coming up yes is it there now your screen is shared now super so yeah. what i've done is that uh, i will do the initial coverage of the standard bipolar resection and beyond the technique i will discuss some aspects which result in a better outcome and discuss a little bit of data from tata so fortunately when you look at this map you can see that in india we still have a much lower incidence of pancreas cancer with that light color you can see uh, so let's uh, you haven't opened up your presentation yeah. you just uh, could you open up the presentation i actually have yeah yeah it's shared just to reshare it again reshare it again Uh, or otherwise you you have clicked the entire screen is it entire screen then share it click on the entire screen then share it yeah i'm doing it now i'm trying my best uh, yeah it's uh, coming up now open your presentation yeah my presentation yeah. open yeah it's now make yeah. it full screen please now yes yeah that's great Everything so could i could i request all the participants to keep themselves muted and please do not press the present now button so silas before that i am pinning you on could you just pin it so that uh, nobody else can interrupt in between on the screen if you take the cursor or your presentation there is a pin button you can pin it yeah i have pinned it yeah that's great and uh, but uh, okay okay ha uh, yeah now make it a full screen now can you see this yeah yeah please make it full screen yeah but 
why is it not becoming full screen when i say full yeah is it okay now yeah it's okay now please right. go ahead right so this is the situation with pancreatic cancer in india you can see that the incidence of pancreas cancer is much lower as compared to europe north america parts of south america and australasia and in a way this is good because we all know how bad and how difficult is pancreas cancer but we are still a country which is 1.3 billion as a result of which we still see a large number of patients of both pancreas cancer as well as periampullary tumors we know that this is a bad cancer and before i go on to the technicalities of the whipple resection we know that the picture on the left side shows that the vasculature is all clean uh, this is an expert audience so i don't need to teach any vasculature as such but you can see the portal vein the splenic vein the superior mesenteric artery a dilated pancreatic duct a pile duct and this is an easy tumor for doing a standard whipple resection and this would be more or less an impossible tumor to technically remove completely and give a meaningful quality of life so we would select patients with the help of a high quality triphasic ct scan people can do an all in one mri also but we are used to a ct scan and it's more widely and easily available in the country as compared to an mri 10 years ago we started realizing that many tumors that we consider are inoperable or locally advanced in inverted commas they are actually not completely locally advanced or unremovable in this picture you have a contact with the blood vessel of about 142 degrees you have collaterals you have some stranding and this is obviously not a nice looking tumor but still can be technically removed and that's when i learned with my radiologist that when you see these tumors you need to understand the contact with the blood vessel circumferential contact of the tumor with the superior mesenteric vein the portal vein and the superior mesenteric artery so one is circumferential contact one is length of contact and one is venous deformity i'm not going to go into these details because professor buckler will discuss with you about vascular resections and extended surgery in pancreas cancer this was a picture of a lady who was sent to me by a surgeon an experienced surgeon saying that this is going to be a vascular resection and this was in 2007 and what you actually see is that there was no vascular involvement i could completely take it off go to the root the tumor was on the posterior aspect and we could do a complete resection without a vascular resection so how can we better predict vascular involvement one is good quality imaging second is experience over a period of time third once in a while and there are two scenarios only in pancreatic cancer when i would do this this is a simple periampullary tumor suspected you see a big pancreatic duct you see a big bile duct again a straight forward looking tumor for surgery a dilated gall bladder but there is no tumor seen and in such a situation if you suspect a tumor because we also live in a medico legal era it's important to do an endosonography at least to see a lesion even if you don't do a biopsy you don't want a situation that you think there is a tumor and there is no tumor at all so what i want to say before i start operating i do a high quality ct scan or an mr with an mrcp eus is extremely selective and very uncommon in our practice but i would do it if i suspect a lesion and don't see one or in borderline resectable disease to assess vascular involvement and to get a tissue diagnosis because many of them would get neoadjuvant treatment in pancreas cancer the second bit is obstructive jaundice we all keep on dealing with a situation where people have jaundice and you don't know whether to do an ercp and put a stent and drain the jaundice or not drain and the evidence is all mixed up unfortunately we see too many patients where the endoscopists have already put a stent and then sent to us but what's our practice in case i get a patient without pre operative biliary drainage what we realize is 
that it's important to realize that the indications are very selective. No routine preoperative biliary drainage in obstructive jaundice. If the patient has cholangitis, then the serum bilirubin level doesn't matter. You need to drain this. If there is coagulopathy, again, no rocket science. You need to drain this. If the patient is nutritionally poor, not immediately ready or unfit for surgery, then you have to again put a stent and try and optimize before you can offer a Whipple resection. If the patient is symptomatic and if I put a stent, I rather wait for a couple of weeks for the patient to become better. Softer indications would be asymptomatic patient with high bilirubin. Sometimes I have got away, but sometimes I've had challenges. And of course, if you have a weightless problem, I'm not proud of it, but yes, in Tata Memorial, we do have a weightless problem of two to three weeks. So it's not always easy to quickly accommodate an asymptomatic jaundice patient. What about tissue diagnosis? I was a part of this paper by the ISGPS. And the important message here is, in the presence of a solid mass suspicious for malignancy, we have a consensus that biopsy proof is not required. I emphasize the not required because I see a lot of patients where repeated attempts at tissue diagnosis have been done. Patient has got anxiety. There is no definitive diagnosis. Patient has lost money. And most importantly, patient has also lost time. So if you have a solid mass, you can proceed to a resection. But of course, you need to confirm a malignancy if you have borderline resectable disease, since they require neoadjuvant treatment. At the end of this, am I always right when I do operate on a patient without a preoperative tissue diagnosis? The answer is no. You can see that about 6.5% of our patients had benign disease on final histology at Tata Memorial. But you can see that on these 29 patients, more than 65% had a mass. There was a double duck sign, one in five. On MR, half of them had a mass. Double duck sign in half percent of them. Suspicious biliary stricture. So a whole lot of things which would guide us and make us worried and make us operate. At the end of it, what we had was that we had various different diagnoses as well. Yes, chronic pancreatitis was 12. But these patients, we had suspected that we would have a malignancy and it was not there. Now we've got great radiology and let's move on to the surgery part of it. And this is something where I start going into the technicalities of a basic Whipple resection. Something very old, but for the younger generation, they would continue to debate and discuss about this. You see a dilated pancreatic duct and an uncinate process mass. The immediate thought process in the mind of any pancreatic surgeon, this is resectable and it's an easy anastomosis. And for that, I must thank our special guest, my teacher, my mentor, Marcus Buechler, because I think what I learned was two or three things here. One is that you first follow and observe closely a master. Second is when you don't have too much of experience yourself, Best is to try and copy any good teacher mentor that you have and try and see what is working well in their hands and why is it working well in their hands. One is the surgical technique, but the rest is also the pre-op preparation, the handling of the pancreas and the post-op care. And I will touch upon that as well. The technicalities, this is one way of doing it. You join the pancreas to the jejunum, interrupted sutures posteriorly, then some ductal sutures, which I've taken three of them anteriorly, three of them posteriorly in the duct, kept them long with 5O PDS. Uh, sometimes people use 6O, sometimes people use 4O. That is dependent on the pancreas texture, the duct size, etc. And then we do it in two layers. It's a combination of ductal mucosa as well as dunking, because mind you, you can have smaller uh, ductules, which can also secrete pancreatic enzymes. So the whole pancreas is kind of drained into the jejunum. Before I learned this technique in Germany, 
we were doing a pancreatic gastrostomy at Tata Memorial. And they were doing quite well, but we still had a mortality which was 6.3. We had a fistula that was before CRPOPF. This was the 205 definition of BASI and the first uh, publication of ISGPF. But then, even then, we got the fistula down in the first four years soon after my time in Germany when we were doing about 30 odd or 35 people resections a year, a little more than two in a month. And that's when I started realizing that God is in the details. As with every surgical procedure, it's important to standardize things if you want to work well as a team. I got this opportunity to look at this very old paper, but important paper because very highly cited. We looked at evidence-based medicine way back in 2006 and 7, and you realize that you can do either a PJ or a PG very well, and don't change a winning team is what I would say. And then whether you have evidence with you or not, it can produce equally good results. From 2007, I have never published anything on pancreas anastomosis. But from 2011 to 2015, there were seven or eight meta-analyses, a number of them in high impact journals, which actually surprised me. I said, why is everyone still talking about a pancreas anastomosis, an old story of an operation done more than 100 years ago? I was gaining in experience with pancreatic surgery, but then we decided that we should come together as an ISGPS group. And this was in Liverpool in 2016. Professor Buchler, as usual, was busy. He came in and went away within a few hours. So he's missing from this picture. But we published this. He guided me for this study. And this paper, again, I want the younger people to look at it in details, if you are interested in pancreatic anastomosis because it looks at the types of anastomosis, duct to mucosa, tunking, binding, putting a stent, not putting a stent, single loop, double loop, putting a drain, early drain removal, no drain, hundreds of things uh, which go into, uh, they are the moving parts of a machine uh, and that's the people operation. Suture, material, preference. What do you do when you do an arterial resection? Is there a different anastomotic technique or you do a total pancreas, etc.? And this is the position statement that we came up with in 2017. Before I'm going to go to the movies, I'm also going to touch upon the biliary anastomotic leak. I think Whipple's is an operation where you do a great resection, but you have only finished half the job. And you do a good PJ and you have finished an even larger part of the job. But don't think that bile ducts don't leak. We still get about 2 to 2.2% patients who would have biliary leaks, even with dilated biliary ducts. This is, again, what I want every surgeon to be aware of. We are human, and despite our best efforts, the human body can respond differently. And there would be certain areas to pay attention to. Appreciate the vascular anatomy at the porta hepatis. It's almost a norm that you will get variations in vasculature going to the liver. I would prefer to use a scissor or a cutting current of a cautery. I know that laparoscopic surgeons or robotic surgeons would argue with me, and I have seen dilated bile ducts being divided by a harmonic scalpel. I don't think I'm getting very old, but I'm more comfortable using a cutting current. Since you have asked me to talk, I'll tell you what we do. Meticulous handling, especially in non-dilated bile ducts, is important beyond vascularity, uh, using fine sutures. And now in the last two years, I've started using an operating loop when I get a non-dilated bile duct or a very small pancreatic duct, um, an interrupted technique, especially for non-dilated ducts. And then you are likely to get a better control. I'm not going to tell you about the parachuting and what is described by Bloomgart and how you do the biliary anastomosis but there should be all the principles of Halstead. Perfect anatomical approximation, excellent vascularity, absence of tension, and then hopefully you will get a flawless biliary anastomosis. Some parts I want to touch as a part of conventional Whipple. 
This is data from our GI pathologist. And you can see the number of cases which are margin positive. 7% of them are even for periampillary tumors that they are margin positive. And 57% are for pancreatic head and uncinate process resections, where I feel it is very nice. I will show you nice intraoperative pictures, but the reality is that it is an R1 resection because of the aggressive nature of this cancer. And that's when I started realizing that if I have to do something more, I must learn to work more on the blood vessels. Again, as always, I went back to Heidelberg in 2009 and stayed with Professor Buchler for a little over a week. And he just taught me constantly how to work on the superior mesenteric artery. So this is what we looked at and tried to compare the infracolic approach of approaching the SMA versus the conventional right medial approach, which you do as you do a cocker maneuver in the supracolic compartment. And then we realized there are actually six other ways by which you can do an SMA first approach. And they are described in this paper very well for different tumors in the uncinate, in the head and in the neck, etc. And again, for the younger members, you have advantages and disadvantages of different approaches. I use a combination of approaches. It's never one approach which is enough. In some cases, I will use two, three, four approaches to make my operation safe and be in complete control for saving the arteries and then planning a vascular resection. The other part has been the work done by the Japanese in 2015. Don't get worried by the complicated diagram. Just look at the three black lines. This is the conventional resection going to the SMA and clearing the mesopancreas. If you have the SMV involved, you go to the left of the SMV. And if you have the SMA involved, you go to the subadventitial plane and then completely remove the tumor without a vascular resection. I'm sure Professor Buchler will really give you a master's opinion on this particular aspect when he speaks. So this is a very old picture of mine. Uh, somebody from the Indian Air Force, a large tumor, vein is involved. The uncinate process goes behind and is normal. I've looped up this SMA. I've looped up the neck of the pancreas. I've made a window in the transverse mesocolon. And then we have cut done a complete resection. So it's a combination of trans mesocolic SMA first versus LV3 because we had to go to the adventitia in order to get a tumor and repair part of the vein. The next thing is that we do these kinds of vascular resections only because SMA is completely free and then you can do an easy vein resection. Do we have data that this helps? Yes, we think it helps. It's not high quality data, but the data does suggest that you will improve your R0 resection rate for a Whipple. And perhaps there is a tendency for patients living better. This is important to know because we have got better chemotherapy also coming up. Don't forget that. With increasing confidence, I've realized that it is not just the Whipple. You can also remove surrounding organs, right kidney, adrenal. In this particular picture is an arterial one. We resected the common hepatic artery and swung the splenic artery to join the right and left liver. But I'm not going to go there. The important message is you can do a little bigger Whipples and have about 40% people who can live for about three years uh, thanks to a combination of chemotherapy and radical Whipple resection. This is an important slide because this is important for India. And this is, I'm sure, experience all over the world. These are about 50 patients where they were opened elsewhere, a bypass was done, or the noting by the surgeon was that there was vascular involvement, so it was too much of an operation to do a Whipple. We looked at the same CT scans uh, that were done for the primary operation, and we felt the vessels are not involved or that we can easily remove it. Vast majority of the patients did not get any chemotherapy, but directly went for surgery. And what we realized was that the involvement was suspected or perceived. That means it was not real vascular involvement. It was suspected. 
And in these patients, we could do a standard Whipple, and the long-term results of this group of patients is comparable to conventional PD. Two messages come out of this. Read your CT scans yourself, and the more experienced you are in a good volume center, the better you will get at being able to do a good Whipple resection. A little bit about enhanced recovery. It's not just about one surgery and having the skills to do it. We must develop the nursing team, the anesthesia team. This is our GI anesthetist. We have got four dedicated GI and HPB anesthetists who look after all our patients for surgery and they also look after ERAS. This is a prospective study and more data will be published not just for pancreas but liver and gallbladder and other surgeries as well. But the message is more than 80% compliance and you will get improved outcomes in terms of perioperative preparation and recovery and patients doing well after a major operation like Whipple. You will see Professor Buchler's data uh, and this is very, very small. I'm his little pupil, but I think this is relevant because this is when I was just coming back from Germany and this is what the journey at Tata Memorial has been and actually, I remember he telling me in 2001, when he first came to India, he said, you should be doing 400 operations a year. And I felt this German has no idea what's happening in India. But now I see what he told me 20 years ago. I think it's easily possible to do 250 or 400 operations a year. We have challenges of OR and other challenges but we will be getting there with good number of resections. Yes, we have published 1,200. A couple of good journals rejected it. And some people asked me, why did you publish in World Journal of Surgery? Well, I don't have a choice. Um, I had to publish if Annals of Surgery and other journals reject it, I have to publish this. But I'm glad that Martin Smith, who is the president of the association, feels that we have done well for a middle income country and not just a low and middle income country, which is what India is. We are an LMIC, uh, but India has different uh, socioeconomic strata and we hope to do much better. And the number is way beyond the 1200 that is published. The important message for a Whipple is please don't be the occasional Whipple surgeon. Everybody enjoys it, but I think you require about 60 operations or so to have less blood loss, less time, improve the length of stay or shorten the length of stay and do better margin negative resections. But the improvement continues throughout the operative career and I continue to learn and enjoy what I'm doing for the last decade and a half. We ventured onto robotic surgery as well, but let's not mistake the fact that you need to understand anatomy and do a standard Whipple. And then you take about 80 cases to reduce your operative time. I'm still struggling. Yesterday, Manas, you heard that we took more than 10 hours to do a robotic Whipple resection, a standard Whipple resection. So it takes time, plus it takes a lot of money. Uh, we will see where it goes, but it's a great tool for surgeons to work with. And I think robotic surgery with its flexibility of the wrist moments, uh, once the platform becomes even more cheaper and easier, I think robotic surgery will have a future uh, as far as Whipple's is concerned. I worked on evidence-based medicine and in this big paper, you will find three Indians over there. And this was last year in Miami where we looked at uh, what is evidence-based guidelines on minimal invasive pancreas resection. We have more and more convincing data about smaller tumors and tumors in the left pancreas. The rest of the data is not convincing. The good part of this paper was we had people who are open surgeons, laparoscopic surgeons, robotic surgeons, and all stakeholders involved in the management of pancreas cancer. So in that sense, this is a combination of evidence, experience, and consensus uh, that we could again come up with some clear guidelines as to how what is the impact of minimal invasive pancreas resection in the year 2019. I'm coming to the end of my talk. This is where we stood last year in December 2019. I will update this slide at the end of next month. But the important thing is Tata took 20 years.
to reach 500 operations. And from 2012 to 16, we did another 500. And from 16 to 19, we have done another 500. So you can see that there has been an exponential rise with an expansion of a dedicated pancreas team. Our two other consultants with me who are excellent surgeons. Uh, we have an honest, clinically relevant fistula rate of 14%. I told you bile leaks are 2%. Our DGE is perhaps not very well recorded. This number would be a little bit more, to be honest. Our hemorrhage is an acceptable one. Median stay for our country where there is very difficult post-operative care available and accommodation is a problem. I'm not proud and I'm very proud to say they stay here for 12 days. I'm not in a hurry to send them home in five and six days and say that we do some extraordinary surgery. The mortality, despite the increase in volume, you can see has come down. But I must admit that this year we have had a, a few bad mishaps, which makes it a difficult year in addition to the pandemic, which is going on all over the world. But I think what gives me more happiness, um, and we will speak and listen to Professor Buchler, but we have about 35 surgeons who have been trained, thanks to my time in Germany, that we have these surgeons perhaps doing very similar operations in tier one, tier two, tier three cities of India. They've all been trained by us at Tata Memorial. And to get on the day of Guru Purnima, the day you remember your teacher, somebody who is working in a tier two town, specifically Solapur, and he says that he could do a great job. He sends me an intraoperative picture of a radical lymphadenectomy and says that he did his first case in Solapur and that he could remember what we have done. I think this is important, that the journey continues uh, right from my time at the turn of the century to the rest of the country. What I presented is the data from Tata and the work of Tata. This is the GI and HPV team that I've had the honor to lead, as well as the disease management group of GI medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, interventional radiologists, uh, everyone connected uh, with GI cancers. Last but not the least, I think it's important that this patient, we did a portal vein resection for him. And there are many, and I'm sure all of you get these kinds of letters. But I think it's more important to know that they are talking that it's an invasive surgery, but even then they see that we encourage them. So it's about counseling, it's about kindness. It's about the expert uh, nature of the team and everything that comes together to get a very satisfying feeling of every single patient. As my dad says, you are only as good as your last operation. It's also very important to know that this was a book chapter published by Dr. Modlin. And this is the picture of Kodbiya, who did the first Whipple resection. Many people think it is Alan Oldfather Whipple. He published three in 1934, but actually it was this man from Italy who actually got famous for transcalcaneal bone traction. But he did this operation long, long, long ago in 1898 is what I think. So I think it's important to stay humble because we are still trying to conquer and get better uh, at doing this operation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And I will stop here, Manas, for now, so that if you agree, then Professor Buchler can uh, yeah. his lecture. And then if we have time, I have the videos of the vein resection and other resections as well. OK, thank you so much, Celeste, for that wonderful, as usual, uh, talk. I think it was heartening to listen uh, your journey through Hippos in this part of the subcontinent. Uh, so it was uh, really nice. Thank you very much, Celeste, for that talk. May so I now I invite, uh, I think, please stop sharing now yeah. so that Professor Buchler can share his screen. Absolutely. Yeah. Professor Buchler, uh, welcome to this uh, platform and we'll be happy to listen to you. Everybody is just waiting to listen to your vast experience in Whipple's resection, one of the largest uh, series in the world. Okay, bin ich drauf? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, you are very much audible. Can can everybody hear and can everybody see? 
Yeah, everybody can see you. Yeah. Everybody can hear you. You can please can go ahead. Can you also see my first slide? Uh, yes, extending the limits of pancreatic cancer surgery. Okay. It's not so only this... Indian surgeon friends. It's uh, multinational from various continents. People are here in the audience. Anyway, please. But this is, but this is only for my Indian surgeon friends, <laughs> not for the other. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. No, we are joking. So it's a big pleasure for me and a big honor to lecture uh, today. Um, and uh, after my uh, very good pupil, Professor Shaila Shrikande, has lectured, in principle, everything was said. So I can concentrate on some other things that Shaila has not mentioned. In fact, I would like to uh, say that since 20 years, since I have been training Shailesh, um, and before, India has really come up as a very dynamic surgical uh, country. I have so many friends there in India, and I'm quite proud that Shailesh Shrikande is so successful besides many other good um, Indian surgeons. So I'm really proud uh, that I have so good Indian friends and even pupils. Now let's go into the question of pancreatic cancer. And I will not uh, take much time, just remind you that um, it started in the last century with pancreatic cancer surgery on a good level. And you see the article from New York from 1986 published by Michelassi and the five year survival was 5%. So this was regarded not bad. Now recently, the ESPA group that is led by John Neoptolemus and myself published a five year overall survival of 30% after surgery plus chemotherapy. So you can see that within 30 years, uh, things have evolved and pancreatic cancer surgery can really contribute to much better um, results. Now, what is the problem of pancreatic cancer surgery? The problem is local recurrence, certainly also distant recurrence. But my friends from the internal medicine they always ask me, how comes that so many patients have local recurrence? And they even move a little further by telling me that what we do is bad surgery. If one third or even one uh, or even 40% of our patients within two years come back with local recurrence, then they say this is bad oncologic surgery. Now, in fact, this is an article about uh, local recurrence and distant recurrence. And you can see that it was within two years, it was 30% local recurrence. And then again, a 7% local and distant. So even in SPAC, we experience 40% local recurrence within two years, which is not good. And this is just an example. You see here, three months post-operatively, there's a slight surrounding uh, of a ring of tissue, which the radiologist will say, we don't like it. This is after six months, and this is after nine months. And here you can see the frank local recurrence around the supermesenteric artery and vein. So, can we prevent this kind of local recurrence? I think we can, but this is not without controversy because to, to do this kind of surgery, you have to be very experienced. So this is what we name the triangle here. This is the celiac trunk and common hepatic artery. This is the supermesenteric artery, and this is the um, portal vein with anastomosis, and then in between is a triangle. And this is the triangle where local recurrence happens. And I ask you as my friends, surgeons, 
how often you have seen this triangle at the end of your Whipple or at the end of your total pancreatectomy. I think many of you will say, I have never seen this. And this is part of the problem. Because you have never seen this, you have done many, many Whipples where you expect, unfortunately, local recurrence within two years. Now, Shailesh has presented this excellent data from Tata Memorial, where he is really uh, an achiever doing 200 Whipples per year and certainly many more in the future. So since I'm in Heidelberg, we have done 12,000 pancreas operations during the last 19 years. And this curve is our monthly curve, not our yearly curve. So we do some 70 to 80 pancreatic resections per month. And this adds up to 700, 800, 900 per year. Most of what we do is pancreatic tumors, 80%, and then some chronic pancreatitis in other pathology. What, most of what we do is pancreatic head resections, close to 5,000. We will do the 5,000 uh, still this year. Most of what we do is pylorus preserving, whipples, and then we also do the bigger operation for chronic pancreatitis. We do a lot of left resections, as you can see, and also total pancreatectomies. This operation has uh, under, undergone a revival. You know, the life quality has become much better, and so we can offer a total pancreatectomy to many patients, for example, with main duct IPNM or advanced pancreatic cancers. Now, our overall reoperation rate is 8.8%. Our overall fistula rate for B and C, so this is real fistula, is 8%. And our overall in-hospital mortality with 9,400 pancreatic resections is 2.9%. So this is absolutely the same what Dr. Shrikande presented to you. And uh, we are training pancreatic surgeons in a row. So this is not excluding any patient. This is all our patients, including total pancreatectomy, including advanced procedures with venous and arterial resection. Now, can you still hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, Jeff, uh, I, I have to ask you because I cannot see you, I cannot hear you, so you can hear me. Okay. Now then, some issues that have become very important. If it comes to radical pancreatic cancer surgery, we have to do an R0. And an R0 nowadays is more than one millimeter distance from the tumor. My uh, co-worker Oliver Strobel, who will take over the chair in Vienna next year, and we are very proud about this, because the Vienna chair is the Billrot chair, and all of you know uh, Theodor Billrot. So Oli will go to uh, Austria, and he has published this data here from our uh, Whipples when we did an R0 resection, but a modern R0, this is this survival curve. So when you do an R0 resection in pancreatic cancer surgery, then you have a 40% five-year survival and a 40 months median survival. So this is really uh, more than we would have expected in the past. And the same is true for the left pancreatic resection. If it comes to pancreatic body or left pancreatic cancers, and if we achieve an R0 resection, then this is a 60 months median survival and a 50% five-year survival. And certainly all these results have been achieved together with adjuvant chemotherapy. So this is not surgery alone. Now, what are we going to do when the cancer is not resectable? And, um, you know, there is cancers that are not resectable. 
the the problem with the resectability criteria is that uh, what is resectable is defined by the surgeon in town. So if the surgeon in town cannot resect, then he or she will say this is not resectable. But resectability is very, very different in different hands. So I'm traveling around the world and I'm uh, then attending these conferences and most of the pancreatic cancers in these conferences are deemed non-resectable. So they present 10 cases and then it is not resectable, not resectable, not resectable, etc., etc. I think you know from what I'm talking about. And then the people say, oh, today we have Professor Buchler from Germany. Uh, we will ask him for his opinion. And then I will say resectable, 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 resectable. And then the atmosphere becomes very sticky in the room. But this tells you that what is resectable is a definition of the surgeons, not a definition of the radiologist or the oncologist. It is a definition of the surgeon. So what is resectable is defined by the surgeon. So this is a case that was not resectable in Heidelberg. And you can see this is a big pancreatic cancer involving all the arteries, and certainly this is not resectable. But after neoadjuvant folfirinox, you can see that the cancer really shrunk down and became resectable. So neoadjuvant treatment is something very important for our patients that are not resectable. However, if you then do your surgery, after neoadjuvant, you have to do it in the right way, namely radical. Here you see the triangle, the celiac trunk, the supermesenteric artery, and the portal vein, and here's the triangle, and your triangle has to be clean. Now this is our resection rate after neoadjuvant, and if we use fulfirinox, then 60% of our patients become resectable. Now, another article from uh, Oliver Strobel is this one here, where we check the role of the lymph nodes. And as you can see here, this is the different survival rates uh, when we look at the lymph nodes. And this is the black curve is N0, and the red curve is one positive lymph node. And as you can see, whether you have one or zero, the survival is the same. So one lymph node is not a problem. However, then two, three or four lymph nodes or even more than six lymph nodes is a problem because your survival will go down. However, what is very important is that you have more than 24 lymph nodes in your pathology specimen. Only then your lymph node staging is correct. Only when you have more than 24 lymph nodes analyzed. Now Dr. Shrikanda was already going into the question of artery first and I will show you some of our Heidelberg techniques regarding artery first, uncinate first and the triangle operation. My former co-worker Professor Jürgen Weitz published in 2010 our artery first which is going directly onto the vena cava and then to the left renal vein and then just above the left renal vein is supermesenteric artery as you can see here and this is our artery first um, and you see it again here at the end of the operation this is the left renal vein this is the aorta uh, inferior vena cava and then this is the supermesenteric artery celiac trunk and this is the triangle again, supermesenteric vein. So this is our artery first. And then Ancinate first, we published also in 2010. Tilo Hackert, who is my deputy uh, chief at this moment. Uh, Ancinate first, which was that time a novel approach. So we come from down to up. We don't cut the pancreas above the portal vein. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this is a problem. This is how we all learned our whipples. We go and we see the pancreas here, and then we cut the pancreas above the portal vein, 
and then we move it to our side and then we put clamps and we remove the pancreatic head but when we do this we leave a lot of pancreatic tissue behind we leave a lot of involved cancer tissue behind so we regard this not as the right technique as against we come from down to up you see here this is the duodenum parse 3 and then we move along the supermesenteric vein and the supermesenteric artery to upwards and by that we clean the whole tissue at these planes and only at the very end we cut the pancreas above the portal vein and then recently we came up with a triangle operation uh, i must say that this word triangle was not invented by ours rather than by Mustafa Adam from Lyon. He, for the first time, used this uh, verb triangle, but we have then worked it out and we name it the triangle operation and we published this for the first time in 2017. And now I'm coming to show you some examples. All of these examples are after neoadjuvant. And as you can see here, this is after neoadjuvant treatment with fulfirinox. And you would say this is frankly not resectable. But in fact, after neoadjuvant, these, these um, radiology images are no longer telling you about what is cancer and what is just a fibrous bulk. And the radiologist will consent this statement that they cannot differentiate cancer from non-cancer after neoadjuvant. So exactly the same here. You can see this was the clearly non-resectable, but this is the, the situation after the operation. You see the celiac trunk, supermesenteric artery, portal vein with end-to-end -end anastomosis, and here the vena cava, and you see the tissue is very clean here. And it was quite easy to remove this fibrous bulk after neoadjuvant. So always think about after neoadjuvant treatment to resect because you can easily get the fibrous bulk out after neoadjuvant. Um, this is just another example after neoadjuvant. And you will see here that your radiologist will tell you 360 degrees surrounding tumor at the celiac axis and 360 degree surrounding tumor at the supermesenteric artery. But this is after Fulfirinox. And then this is just the example again, the other example, celiac trunk, supermesenteric artery, portal vein with end-to-end -end anastomosis. This was the former gastroduodenal artery all the field is clean and certainly the surrounding tissue here supermesenteric artery 360 degree celiac trunk 360 degree you get easily off by dissecting everything directly on the adventitia uh, and uh, we will come back to this uh, this is a new technique that has been um, described by my friend uh, Miao Yi from Nanjing that you remove the tissue at the arteries directly and it's an easy removing after neoadjuvant. Okay, portal vein resection. You know our classification of portal vein resection, just a um, little resection and then a patch and then an end to end and then a graft is type 4. Uh, our friends from France have given us this technique here. You can just take the parietal peritoneum and produce either a vein or just a patch and use this as a resection patch or portal vein. And yes, we use it. You see here a type 2 patch onto the supermesenteric vein. This is just the peritoneum. And then we certainly do end-to-end, -end, as you can see here, end-to-end -end supermesenteric vein to portal vein. It's an easy reconstruction. This is the end result. 
And then we also use prosthesis when the distance is too long, because if your if your stretch is too much, then your portal vein will occlude. And therefore, if the distance is too long, you better use a prosthesis to bridge. Now then you also can do your uh, splenic vein back to your portal vein, or you can also do your splenic vein down to your renal vein, or you can also use for the splenic vein a prosthesis and go down to the inferior vena cava or to the renal vein to secure the drainage from the left side of the pancreas. You can also do a reinsertion of the coronary vein. You see here, once in a while, uh, you have a very uh, congested uh, stomach. Look at the color of the stomach. It is very blue here. And then we reinsert the coronary vein to preserve the stomach. And this is uh, also a kind of a procedure. You see, we go directly to the portal vein with the uh, coronary vein. The stomach is still blue. Watch this. And then after the procedure is finished, look at the stomach is now well perfused and no longer blue and the whole venous blood drains into the portal vein. So then about arteries. I will go into artery. We have developed some techniques. For example, the splenic artery is an ideal artery. We say it is from God for the pancreatic surgeons to replace other arteries. Uh, we have published this in 2014. And you either use the splenic artery by just moving <coughs> the splenic artery to the hepatic artery. This is a so-called transposition. Or you can also use the splenic artery as an interposition. Um, and the splenic artery is a wonderful artery. As you uh, can see in this piece here, this is also a transposition behind the portal vein to a uh, hepatic artery. And this is a transposition in front of the portal vein. And here you see the end-to-end -end portal vein and the transposition. So I recommend to you the splenic artery for whatever kind of reconstruction. You can also go with the splenic artery down to the supermesenteric artery if necessary. So, but then we also use allograft when we need, um, for example, to replace this celiac trunk or to replace this portal vein if we need. And then we can also use allograft. You can see here, this is a um, cut uh, celiac trunk. And then there's the clamp on here. And then we use an iliac bifurcation from the refrigerator and put it on here. And then the two ends go to the two hepatic arteries, as you can see here. This is right hepatic artery, left hepatic artery, and this is the interposition. So we have become um, arterial surgeons because we do this now regularly if we have to resect an involved part of the arteries. Um, you can also do a supermesenteric artery end to end. As you can see here, you have three centimeters uh, playground. If you have to resect the supermesenteric artery, three centimeter is easily done end to end. Otherwise, you have to use the splenic artery or an interposition. And then in the rare situation where your hepatic arteries are either dissected or are not available, then we put the hepatic artery to the portal vein. So this is named a portal vein arterialization to bring um, high oxygen into the liver via the portal vein. And this we only do when we do not have an hepatic artery that we can anastomose. For example, if you have done um, 
uh, during your dissection, you have done, you, you have killed the hepatic artery, and then we put the hepatic artery towards the port vein. Just another um, exception, if necessary. And this is showing you the arterialization. You see here onto the portal vein. Then if you do a, um, a uh, imaging, you see the arterialization. So my uh, good uh, pupil, Jürgen Weitz, has published this article about arterial resection and meta-analysis. And as you can see, if you do arterial resection, your uh, morbidity, mortality will go up your mortality up to 6-7%, but um, the overall survival can become better when you use arterial resection. This is just another example um, of uh, venous uh, reconstruction. And um, our friends from Mayo Clinic, you know, we have been uh, dealing with arterial resection since many years. Meanwhile, I want to say uh, my friends in America are more interested in arterial resection. For example, the Mark Trutti group from, uh, from Mayo Clinic, you see what he is doing. I think this is really interesting. You see, this is a Y graft that you normally use to go from the aorta to the legs, but he uses a Y graft from the aorta to the uh, hepatic artery and to the supermesenteric artery. So you see the multi-vessel reconstruction in pancreatic cancer surgery is advanced and uh, you can also do it if you want and if you are encouraged. Now, this we recently published in the Annals of Surgery, arterial resection pancreatic cancer, effective after a learning curve, um, we did some 400 pancreatic uh, arterial uh, surgeries. And um, as you can see here, in the beginning, the mortality was high, 20%. Sorry, where is my curve here? 20%, 16%, 14%. Now we are down to 7% if we do arterial resection. But if you start you have a higher uh, mortality figures. But on the other hand, this is our curve regarding learning curve. So to do a safe arterial resection, you have to be a safe pancreatic surgeon. And then at least you have to do 15 uh, arterial resections to come into a plane where your outcome becomes better. So I will finish up with the issue of adjuvant treatment. You know that uh, John Neoptolemos, um, Claudio Bassi, some other surgeons, Helmut Fries, Hans Beger, we were the pioneers of adjuvant chemotherapy. This is our article in the New England Journal from 2004 about adjuvant chemotherapy. And you remember these uh, figures adjuvant chemotherapy is significantly better for the survival than no chemotherapy, and adjuvant chemoradiotherapy is even worsening the survival. So after SPAC1 data, adjuvant chemoradiotherapy was principally uh, abolished, uh, and this was one of the footprints of SPAC. And then SBAC4 uh, was recently published in The Lancet. Again, the same group, John Neoptolemus, our first author, and Claudio Bassi and many others uh, have contributed. And this was the randomized controlled trial where we compared gemcitabine versus gemcitabine, capacitabine, adjuvant. And the best group was the adjuvant gemcitabine, capacitabine. And you see this is the R0 group with a 40% uh, five-year survival. So not only in a single center such as Heidelberg or Tata Memorial, but also in a multi-center when you uh, can do an R0 
with adjuvant gemcitabine, capocitabine, you reach a 40% five-year survival. But more interesting is this trial here, you know, the Brodage trial, which was a French-Canadian trial with adjuvant fulfirinox. Uh, this is fantastic data because recently published in the New England Journal, these authors reached an, um, a 54 months median survival after Whipple um, when you use adjuvant fulfirinox. And I think this is the future and we have changed our uh, in-house uh, standard towards adjuvant fulfirinox meanwhile because every second patient can be saved with uh, a good surgery plus adjuvant fulfirinox. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm finishing up uh, at this moment now by saying thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Thank you to my Indian friends. Thank you to Shailesh Srikande in bringing uh, this kind of surgery to your country. And I hope that if you do uh, more radical pancreatic surgery, if you combine this with uh, excellent adjuvant treatment, you can reach a 40 to 50 percent uh, five-year survival, which is so much better than we learned from our teachers in the past. So thank you very much for the attendance. Manas, we can't hear you. We still can't hear you, Manas. Meanwhile, I enjoyed your talk, Professor Bukla, as always, inspiring and motivates us at Start a Memorial to do more. But let's wait to hear from Manas. I think he has some audio problems. I can hear you, Shailet. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. I can hear you, but Manas, okay. I'm not able to hear our host. Can can our our people hear us? Uh, yeah, could you hear me now? now? Ah, now yeah. we can hear Dr. Yeah. Manas. Yeah. Could you hear yeah. me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, Manas was. Hey. Is it audible? Is it audible now? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah we thank can you. hear you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Butler, for that wonderful insight into pancreatic resections and, in fact, opening up uh, the uh, ideas of uh, survival figure, how it changes with the resections. Uh, that's wonderful to see. And, uh, in fact, uh, uh, could you, Silas, uh, show one uh, small clipping, video clipping of uh, pancreatic ojezonostomy and a portal vein resection, a short video clip of five, seven minutes? You are muted, Silas. You are muted. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, I will show you. I, I think I think after your video, uh, we'll take up questions with Professor Buchler. That will be fine. Sure, I will yeah. take up. Sure. Um, we will take up and we will show you the short video just now, and um, it has an audio. You just tell me whether you are able to hear the audio as well. I don't even have to talk. You will be happy. Okay. But, can you hear? Uh, it does. Yes. Female hypertension. Yes, yes, yes. It's audible. So to save time, I will go ahead with all this. Yeah, please. To the operation. Go right to the operative part. Yes. Yeah, we'll save time. So this is a subcostal incision. If the patient is heavier, I still prefer a subcostal. This is in a workshop, I should be honest. But in a little bulky patient, I would prefer subcostal. A thinner patient, I take a midline incision. So we isolate the wound. And now, do you not use any retractors? Thompson or something, anything? But I'm coming to the main part. This video okay. is from the left side of the surgeon, and okay. this is operating from the right side. We are going to the neck of the pancreas. 
the usual blood vessels, the gastrocolic or the loop of Henle, so that you separate it completely. The third and fourth part of duodenum are further mobilized as one gets access, as well as the vasculature is taken care of. Then you can see my middle finger exposing it as we go to the right of the superior mesenteric vein, making sure that the vein is safeguarded. That's the middle colic vein, and that's where the inferior mesenteric comes. That's the first retinal vein as well. At this stage, we make sure that the neck is safe, and we've also exposed the superior mesenteric artery, which is now swung to the right. That's the SMV, that's the superior mesenteric artery, which appears to the right when it's in fact to the left of the vein. This is the advantage of a very good Cocker maneuver. And with this, one can even divide the duodenum and jejunum in the supracolic compartment. So this is the advantage that the surgeon has a complete sense of control of the vasculature. And this is a combination of SMA first and ANSINA first dissection as we do now. Next, we focus our attention to the supraduodenal region, the hepatoduodenal region, taught again the left hand of the portrait. At this stage, you should be careful. The video is now from the right side of the surgeon over my shoulder. The camera position has changed. Once you are sure, you will be in a comfortable situation to do this dissection, either with a bipolar or with a scissor or with a monopolar current as we are normally used to at the Tata Memorial Hospital. You can see the traction of the left hand of the first assistant, which makes the dissection easier. And now we focus on patient aid, that's the common hepatopathy node, which is being again mobilized carefully without damaging the pancreatic capsule and making sure that the hepatic artery underneath is safeguarded. Flimsy peritoneal communications are also mobilized to move the duodenum away and also to expose the gastroduodenal artery as it comes into view. Patient aid continues along the left border of the common hepatic artery as well as the left border of the portal vein. At station 12 nodes, and station 8A continues behind the common hepatic artery as 8B. So, what is mobilized is the lymph nodes along the portal vein, along the left border of portal vein. Again, one has to be careful because the portal vein is right behind. You must have control over the foramen of lymph flow right at the beginning of the operation. My left index finger shows you that I have the control over the vein. We now remove station 3 lymph node, taking care that the hepatic artery and the veins are free. Now you see the graft the ordinal artery with my middle finger, you see the common hepatic artery going to the liver, and you know at the level of which we are going to do the production of the GDA. I go Our ahead with the cholesis. Yeah. That's now we check with the bones out that the, the GDA is fine and there is no issues. And then the right we deploy divide, the, we the, divide the stomach and we have divided well. the right gastric at the suprapyloric region. And, and then, then you divide the stomach, yes. and now I'm taking sutures on the neck of the pancreas. We have care of, and we also now get some we mobilize the small bowels. I divide with a knife, cut margin is not and the last bit of the ancillary behind the neck. First, right behind the neck of the pancreas, which is divided now, is being done. Kindly note how the vein is being rolled away, both by the assistant's finger and by my left index finger to make sure that the lymphadenectomy is complete. The clips that you see are can be for inferior pancreatic or duodenal artery, but usually they are for lymphatics, but better to be safe than sorry. And at this stage, the complete transaction is achieved. There are some additional users which can be there from the pancreatic cut surface. We use 5-0 round body rolling. Handle the pancreas gently. Remember Halstead always and respect the tissues so that the tissues respect us back. The pancreas is being mobilized off the superior mesenteric vein and the portal vein because you want the jejunum to go behind. Foramen of wind flow is clear. Lymphadenectomy is complete. We are fully satisfied with the hemostasis. And this is where we show you the anatomy. Now we give a good thorough peritoneal wash. Make sure that hemostasis is satisfactory. And then it's time to bring up the jejunum into the supracolic compartment to the right of the middle colic artery through the we place the anterior ductal sutures in a fashion which is clockwise 10 o'clock 12 o'clock 2 o'clock and then posterior ductal sutures are placed 
four o'clock, six o'clock, eight o'clock. Anterior is outside, is now open. And now we do the second layer from posterior aspect, and that's the posterior ductal sutures to the full thickness of the jejunum being joined. Not bouting out. And then carefully make sure that the knots are coming on the jejunal serosa rather than the knots falling on the pancreatic capsule. So you see that the PJ, exactly as I showed you in the picture and as I have learned this from Professor Buchla, I have not changed this technique more or less, barring some variations sometimes. No but this is what we do as a standard in Tata today, uh, including my two excellent colleagues, Dr. Bandari and Dr. So Chaudhary. So this is where I will stop. I don't think I'll show you a hep J because yes. that standard. Yes. I will show you... Um, I will show you a portal vein resection, just a short one. Is that okay with time? Yeah, 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 absolutely. No problem. I will show you in five minutes. I won't show you the whole thing again. Can you see this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is standard, standard case. I told you what is BRPC, what is locally advanced, maybe unresectable. I learned this about 10 years ago, but look also at the patient's biology and condition when you plan a vascular resection. Artery first, a tumor of four by four centimeters. This is the CT scan. We have chosen a simple case for showing a vein resection. And you can see at a particular stage uh, uh, that there is a circumferential contact of 140 degrees, length is 2.5, and there is some venous deformity present. That's about it. Nothing more than that. So it's not a complex vein resection. But you can see the transverse mesocolon. You can see the inflammation with attacks of pancreatitis. Sometimes you have to get the colic vessels also away. And I would not hesitate to do that so that you stay away from areas of inflammation. And you know that the vein is involved. So you need to be careful that you do not give undue traction on a vein which is involved. And then you start slowly clearing the tissues in a way that you expose the SMV. And this is what you can see uh, my colleague Manish Bandare was doing this at this stage. Uh, this video was presented in uh, the Indian chapter meeting in Jaipur last year. That's when we prepared. So it's a year and a half old video. And we will update this video to also add the uh, patch technique, which Professor Buchler spoke about, uh, done by him and from the group in Lyon. Uh, this is all standard non-dilated biliary system, and then dividing cholecystectomy, getting the right gas take away, looping the common bile duct above the insertion of the cystic duct, and then dividing it with a cutting point of cautery, then isolating the common hepatic artery, then looping the superior portal vein as it leaves from behind the neck of the pancreas. The lymphadenectomy is done as I showed you in the previous video. And then these are the usual branches which drain into the portal vein from the softer part of the uncinate process. Mind you, there is always this question about length of vein resection. You can tease off a lot of tissue off the vein so that your ultimate length of vein resection can be reduced than what it sometimes appears on your scans. This will require some time and patience. We make sure that the gastroduodenal is not the dominant blood supply to the right and left liver. Uh, once in a while it will be and you may have to dissect it, reconstruct, etc. So we would do that and then the stomach is moved away. Now we start focusing again on the inferior neck of the pancreas because we finally want the tumor to hang on the involved portal vein area. So you can see with some dissection, you will still be able to safeguard the vein, which in the beginning doesn't appear uh, to be the case. Best is scissor dissection. And then we are looping the superior mesenteric vein and this is again a part of SMA first that we are going to the left of the vein. Remember LV2 and SMA first at the transverse mesocolon. This is the same plane where you will go for doing 
your left pancreatectomies or doing pancreatic neck tumors and we will expose the SMA. Because now this is where mm -hmm. doing an ancinate first and SMA first comes into play. So I always tell younger surgeons uh, that it's good to do all these procedures in standard operations first so that when you actually get to do a difficult operation, you will be able to use SMA first and ancinate first to get the length of a tumor uh, and then finally do a vein resection. Now, you see, very often the vein is involved, not involved anteriorly, but if it is, you go to the left. In this case, we have shown you 140 degrees of contact only. A hard pancreas as it can happen with pancreatic cancer so sometimes we would divide it with a big duct uh, with a monopolar cautery i have no problem with that the duct is big the anastomosis is low risk now i know the vein involvement is here but this priority is long and we are trying to clear the superior pancreatic or duodenal nodes uh, we would do more and more of the triangle there is some disturbance but here the focus is on the section. We are coming to the last part before I stop this video for the question answers. So now we see the length of the vein. This is the splenic vein. This is the portal vein. I don't have to resect the splenoportal confluence. We just have to put uh, two nice clamps here and resect it. It was 140 degrees. We don't even require a big cattle brush. But you can easily resect about three to four centimeters and do a primary end-to-end -end ISGPS type 3 anastomosis. So make sure the tumor is now all hanging on the vein. These are great clamps gifted to me by Professor Buchler. I'm very grateful to him. He gave that to me in 2009 and I still use them. And they are known as Allenberg vascular clamps, a vascular surgeon who has patented them with Esculap. And um, then we make sure that there is complete sense of control. And then we just count every three minutes so that there is no uh, bowel congestion at all. You know, it can easily be done for 20, 25 minutes, but I do not take any stay sutures. I just use a 5-0 proline, outside double-ended, outside in, little heparinized saline, nothing else. They afterwards get low molecular weight heparin like every cancer patient for solid tumors. They require nothing else for a vein resection. So the assistant is rolling the SMA. There is no traction from the transverse meso. Uh, and then you bring the suture from outside in one of the ends of 5 proline, And then it's just under vision, a standard running suture. So with good organization and thinking through the procedure in the mind, um, as I've always gradually learned first from my father and then from Professor Buchla and then, you know, also Dr. Nande, that you do one, then you do 10 and then you do 100 and it starts to get better. So now a vein resection is quite standard for us. And we are also now doing a few arterial resections, which is mainly being pushed forward by my younger colleagues as well in Tata. So this is the posterior wall, which is coming without tension uh, and we make sure all is okay. And it's from say three o'clock to nine o'clock posterior wall done. Now I take the other end of the 5-0 proline and then I again do a running suture to complete this uh, anastomosis, which I'll show you towards the end. We give a little growth factor and we keep the last one or two sutures a little loose. And then I release the inferior clamp to kind of stretch the anastomosis. Now you see, I'm not taking it tight. I'm keeping last couple of sutures loose. Make sure that you are well organized. Let there be a good blood letting, blood flow, growth factor, whatever you call it. And then anastomose it or tighten it, but not by causing a constricting effect, but just keep it there. It stretches out well, and then there is no problem. So the anastomosis is done. And then before that, I've checked that there is no twist. I have seen when I go to the infracolic compartment, the bowel is all looking clean. And then I told you dilated duct and easy anastomosis with no danger to the vein. 
I think I'll stop it here so that we have time for question answers. Shall I stop here? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Silas. Uh, thank you. That was a wonderful video. So I think uh, we can take up uh, questions from the audience. Uh, uh, Professor Buechler, for you, there is a question that outcomes after vascular resection in pancreatic cancer, especially after portal vein resection. I'm I'm sorry. What? Uh, I mean, after oh, what's yes, the yes. outcome? What's the outcome after portal vein resection? Um, we have just submitted an abstract to the American surgical about 800 portal vein resections and the outcome is that if it is a portal vein resection only then there is practically no more morbidity than a whipple without portal vein. If it is a portal vein resection plus uh, multivisceral or plus artery, the outcome regarding morbidity is much worse. Um, Long-term survival with portal vein resection is difficult to determine because there is no control group where a portal vein resection was necessary but has not been done. So therefore, portal vein resection, I think, will enable an outcome that you normally do not achieve. So therefore, I would expect that portal vein resection, as we have seen with Dr. Shrikande, Professor Shrikande, is really contributing to R0. And if it contributes to R0, then I think you have a survival benefit. But there have never been a controlled trial portal vein resection in, a, in patients that need it versus no portal vein resection. So therefore, we can estimate. So how do you suggest that a surgeon should start uh, portal vein resection? A surgeon who is doing uh, regular ripples, uh, when and how he should start a portal vein resection? Or which case you should pick up? Uh, I think the first thing is that you have to be trained by someone who is really experienced. Okay. So that when you do it first time, you should always have someone at the table who, who have done, I don't know, 50 or 100, and who is a real safe surgeon. Then the, the learning surgeon, will have an, e an easy learning because the principles of portal vein resection, you know, that you have a clear field, that the tension is not too large, that you, you have um, a good view. This is only possible if you have someone at the table who knows to do this. So then you should start, I think, with an end-to-end because this is the easiest to do the patch, to do the uh, prosthesis. I mean, you should start with the so-called uh, number three or type three end to end as Professor Shrikanda has shown to us, where you have a clear lumen, which is big enough, and then an end to end running suture. This is the start. And then later you do the more demanding ones, but you have to have someone at the table who has experience. Otherwise, it can be a disaster. Silas, what is your opinion on this? How you started your portal vein resection? Who was uh, on your table when you started? Professor Buchler was in Germany by that time. Yeah, so I will tell you it is not always easy. And here I must tell you, I don't know whether Dr. Jagannath is here somewhere. But, I um, think he was the, here. So some of the standard, uh, you know, the type 1, the side wall, things like that are the easy resections. But there was this one particular case uh, where it was the end of the day. I had done a difficult resection and I was going to require a prosthesis and a graft. 
I have a, I had a, I had a vascular surgeon way back in 2009 to do the actual anastomosis, but I was less comfortable with SMA. It was a large pancreatic tumor, and I was the only surgeon in the hospital, and I had no help. But Dr. Jagannath, who had left a few years before, I did give him a call, and he was in another hospital. You know, he's in Lilavati, but he came in the evening, and he helped me out. So exactly what Professor Butler told you. If you run into a difficult situation where you have no previous first-hand experience, you, if, if you're alone, I think the first thing is to show maturity to call for help. And calling for help is not fighting with your ego. It is somebody's life at stake, point number one. Point number two, if you have got trained, I think the first thing is to think about the procedure in your mind. If it's clear in your mind, it is coming on the operation table if you are doing pancreatic surgery regularly. So I think what we have tried to convey is that I gave the initial part of the lecture about standard Whipple resections without touching blood vessels. I think one surgeon should be able to do that very well. Then comes the sidewalls. Then comes the standard type 3. And then comes the excellent complex work with Professor Sherry. So I think there is no excuse for you need to have patience. You need to have time. You need to have experience, so better to be in an experience center. If you do all this together, you will develop. For example, the younger surgeons in Tata who spent three years with us, uh, because now we do so much of pancreatic work, a large number of them are able to do an excellent pancreatic operation. And those who want to do more of pancreatic surgery will start doing better and better robotic and vascular work, like my two younger colleagues in Tata. I think I do vascular work because I know that they are now there with me. Uh, it's not always nice to just keep on doing it alone. It's not easy. It's not easy. Okay. There is uh, another question is uh, how to reduce the chance of uh, delayed gastric emptying? What should be the minimum distance between the J and GJ? Professor, you should answer this. What do yeah. you do to reduce minimum? Uh, uh, minimum Professor Buechler, what's the uh, how you reduce the chance of delayed gastric emptying? Um, and Shailu. how much distance you keep between the HJ and the GJ? Ah, okay, okay, I got it. How much distance between the the HJ and, and J and biliary, and GJ. biliary and GJ? So, Professor Buechler. Uh, I think what he tries to say is that from the pancreas, you keep some gap between pancreas and bile duct, and then from bile duct to margin. And okay. Okay. gastric emptying, what do you do to reduce delayed gastric emptying? Any techniques, any special things you do? First of all, I have no techniques to reduce delayed gastric emptying. Delayed gastric emptying has something to do with pancreatic inflammation. So when the pancreas is inflamed after your whipple and the stomach is laying on, this is causing delayed gastric emptying, number one. And um, number two is most of the delayed gastric emptying will, will disappear after, after just a while, one week or two weeks. So our distance between the pancreatico jejunostomy and the bile duct anastomosis mm -hmm is something like 30 centimeters, three zero. And then between the biliary anastomosis and the stomach is something like 40 centimeters. So this is our distances. And um, the, the delayed gastric emptying, we have a frequency after whipple of something like 15%. Um, most of it is, is very benign. So if it persists, then we do endoscopy because once in a while the, the pylorus is kind of contract. So then if we go through with an endoscope, it will work. So therefore, um, delayed gastric emptying is not how can I say, a real problem after pancreatic surgery. 
And do you believe that the pancreatic stumps should be mobilized to a good length before you do a pancreatic ostomy? Yes. I think we need one centimeter or even more uh, if the local situation um, is necessary for that. But one centimeter is our standard. And once in a while, when the pancreas, I mean, when the pancreas is hard, you can do whatever you want. It will heal up, okay? You can do three rows, one row. You can do pancreatic duct or not. You can do, you can do. But if the pancreas is soft, you have to have your safe anastomosis uh, available. Otherwise, you are running in trouble. And for the soft pancreas, you should have it well mobilized, like one centimeter to two centimeter mobilized. If it is hard, uh, you can just suture it on whatever you have. So, Manas, I can yes. add, it, uh, yeah. it's very difficult to speak after Professor has spoken, but I can add some small things like when you mobilize sure. the pancreas, I mm -hmm. think it's important in a soft pancreas that you do not handle the pancreatic capsule. So okay. the ability to mobilize without touching or handling the pancreas too much requires gentleness. Otherwise, we can always take thick sutures or the first assistant or the second assistant inadvertently, not deliberately, can end up tagging on any of the sutures and at a microscopic level, these sutures are causing fine tears in the pancreas. So you might do a great job, but in the end, you will have a failed anastomosis. So I think careful, everything has to be very careful and don't touch the capsule as far as possible. There are good questions here. Good questions I can see. So the question is, if you do a portal vein and an artery, when do you do the portal vein and when do you do the artery? Now, what is extremely important is that you never run into the situation where you have cut the artery and the portal vein and your liver is completely and warm ischemic. This is a disaster. So this needs to be avoided. And for that, you always do the portal vein first, if ever possible, because the portal vein is the easier then you do the portal vein and then you have time enough to do your artery. That is more reminding. And never run into the situation where you have to close both at once. This will cause a lot of liver ischemia. So this is the answer to that. Then there was a question regarding drainage. So this is what a wonderful question. Okay. You don't you believe in drains? It Sign has up. been shown Sign in up. several randomized control trials that you do not need any drain. Yeah. And this is the reason why we train once in a while. Okay? So the answer is you don't need a drainage. You can really do it without. And yeah. in, in, I want to say in the majority of cases now, we do not drain. Because the outcome is the same. And but in, why, some cases, in which case you decide to drain? Which case you decide to drain? Yeah, this is, a, you know, because we are humans and we are stupid, we still drain. Okay. But so what is, what is the reason to drain? You know, surgeons find 100 reasons to drain. True. My friends, my co-workers, they find hundreds of reasons to drain. The patient was too yeah. fat, too old, too bloody, too stupid. Yeah. So there's many, many reasons <laughs> to drain. Yeah. But in yeah. fact, you do not need to drain. Okay. What's your criteria of irresectability, yeah. Dr. Buechler? When you decide that this is not resectable. I think everything you showed about the arterial resection, venous resection, I mean, it didn't appear that anything is irresectable. Okay, at this moment, at this moment, vein, vein is never a contraindication for surgery. Vein, okay. all vein, supermesenteric vein is always surgery. But artery, when we know about arterial involvement, then we, then we do neoadjuvant treatment. 
with so Falfirinux. Exactly. I want to, I want okay. to raise this specific issue with you. I have a question for you. You said that Bain is never a problem, but one issue that always comes, the more inferiorly you go, and then the jejunal branches come in. Do you encounter situations where you would feel that the anastomosis of the vein inferiorly is so difficult or so small or so narrow that you might compromise or jeopardize the patient's recovery and or the prognosis and then you sometimes back out um, yeah. you know I I a small yeah. series in your journal recently but that's a very small series of seven patients where yeah. we clamp and don't reconstruct and they do well with collaterals but what do yeah. you do to reconstruct so yes this is a very specific situation that we have all uh, experienced and um we always try to do a reconstruction um mm -hmm. but once in a while i mean what what can i say that you have you have different options shailash one option is to close the portal vein because you cannot reconstruct and then the problem is the liver needs a portal vein so then you take the right renal vein the right renal vein and put it onto the portal vein so that you have a liver portal venous perfusion okay this is an exception but we do it exceptionally if we cannot get the super mesenteric vein together with the portal vein so then you can close and check whether the bowel will tolerate and then you put the right renal vein onto the portal vein the liver will survive this is an option Another option is if you don't get the supermesenteric vein or collaterals, then you can also get the collateral down to the vena cava, mm -hmm. like like a good old-fashioned okay. vena cava, and then again again the right renal vein to port vein. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. I so then you have on. you have some exceptional situations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the clarity. And there is another question for you. Um, size of pancreatic duct uh, is is not good. And then, do you anytime do just a dunking anastomosis because you can't do a ductum mucosa? If I cannot do ductum mucosa, then I just go around. Yeah. And I, I do our type uh, of anastomosis without duct. How common is this in your practice? If you don't find a duct. Extremely rare, Shailesh. My eyes, my eyes are still functioning. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you ever uh, felt the need of doing a uh, pancreatic or gastrostomy anytime, Dr. Buchler? No, I hate this. Never. I hate it. You hate it. I hate okay. It. I, I never do. I, I want to say, okay, we do it uh, once in 1,000 resections. When when one of my co-workers is uh, doing it and I'm I'm not in town. Okay, so, okay. So, so people uh, look for that your absence in the town so that they can go ahead for a PG. Do you mean that? <laughs> no, I, we, we have not uh, adopted any... Uh, anastomosis with the stomach um, okay. I, yeah. I, but I don't yeah. want to say that you cannot do it okay you, you can do it if you have experience enough you can do it and I don't blame this operation I just want to say we don't do it yeah. okay this is fine Manu, I must yes. to the younger audience the, the evidence and yes. that's quite good evidence because usually centers publish the single center data. I showed you Tata data, Professor showed Heidelberg data. But there is one multi-center randomized trial done in Germany by a gentleman called Tobias Keck. And he compared PG versus PJ multi-center, which is important for us to know. And they found a significantly high incidence 
of upper GI bleeding after doing a PJ, PG. PG, so okay. That PG is bad, but there was one question also which came in the chat that off late they are having more bleeding at the back of your stump post pancreatectomy and they do a PG. I think we should be aware of this. And the other thing is, if at all, God forbid, you get a leak with a PG, it's like a posterior gastric perforation. And then feeding also becomes a problem. But you do what makes you comfortable and working well in your hands. Yeah, yeah I think that, that's the final point. Again, if a surgeon is comfortable with some particular technique and he's getting best of results, uh, probably yeah. it's always advisable, as Professor Buechler also told. I mean, yeah. if somebody is uh, getting good results in a particular technique, so yeah. there is no uh, harm in continuing that. But but, but, uh, in, young patients, but in young patients, Manas, if you are yes. doing O-grade tumors, neuroendocrine mm -hmm. tumors, solid papillary okay. epithelial neoplasms, etc., doing a PG can really cause long-term pancreatic enzyme insufficiency completely. So when there are issues of affordability, people requiring lifelong pancreatic enzymes, with good long-term survival for neuroendocrine and other tumors, I think we have to rethink about doing a PG, even if it's working well in our hands, just to bring forward the discussion point, that's all. Okay, okay, good. I think uh, we need to take a few more questions uh, from uh, the Dr. chat. There is yes, a um, by Dr. Cameron. Yeah, the, there is a comparison between PG and PG. It's, it's already done. Uh, Madhubanda, I told you in my paper with the ISGPS, uh, we said yeah, that yeah. everything is fine. So we know the AO paper and the Cameron paper long ago in annals, comparing PG and PA, and that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Dr. Suresh, you, uh, do you do the frozen section of the resection margin of the pancreas? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, not all periampillary tumors, but pancreatic head cancer is definitely. And now in the India, where you also start to see slowly more and more IPMN, I know we see much less as compared to America and Europe, but I also feel the eyes do not see what the mind does not know. But now we are gradually beginning to see. So we are aware that there can be associated IPMN as well. So we do a neck margin for pancreatic head cancer. We do usually because so much alcoholic pancreatitis where the Multicenticity of the disease is more common. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, is, sorry, sorry, Madhubana. Like just a dissection, and the most of the like alcoholic patients, yeah. when the pancreatitis is more common, and multicenticity is also incidence more common. Yeah. So, yeah. so in pancreatic head trans cancers, I think frozen yeah. has got a definite role, but uh, not in an ampullary tumor per se. Yeah. 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 Unless you have some doubt, and then you. Yeah, can absolutely. Answer. Absolutely. Uh, professor, again, uh, it's it's the same question from my colleague whom you have met, who asked you the nice question about the vein and artery. He asked you a second question because we are looking at systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and Manish is asking you. Any experience with hydrocortisone or steroid in a high-risk pancreas anastomosis or when you see post-operative acute pancreatitis, hyperamylasemia, you know the whole game. Any role for steroids to abort this because there is a paper published from the Scandinavian countries uh, looking at steroids in the acute phase. Um. <clears throat> I find this idea very interesting. I have no experience. Okay. I must say, but I find it very interesting because the pancreas can react a kind of a hyper-inflammatory organ yeah. Yeah. after the operation, and yeah. um, I think to cool this down, this could be could be a measure. As far yeah. as I remember, there was a controlled trial about steroids. Uh -huh. as far as I remember, and it did not help. So the idea is fascinating, but we have to find out. Okay, okay. Then um, there is another question of uh, Professor Buechler. Have you ever done a pancreatic or duodenectomy in chronic pancreatitis? And how often, if you have oh, done? He gave huge data. I mean, he's, uh, I should, I'll answer a little bit for him. Okay. The bigger operation and the burn operations 
our completely buclear and bigger story for chronic pancreatitis. Some of the most original research work on chronic pancreatitis is by Professor Buchler and Helmut Fries. And I was fortunate to work with them in the lab to bring about some work on tropical chronic pancreatitis with H. Ramesh, which was in 98, 99, and 2000. So they do a lot, and they do far more inflammatory head masses in the pancreas as compared to we getting to see mainly dilated duct disease and not always head masses. So their oh. combination of alcohol, acute and chronic, and pancreatic head masses still remains common. So they do a lot of head resections for CP as he showed in his data. Sorry, Professor, I answered for you. But oh, you can fine, fine. Fine, fine. fine. Uh, I think if the alcohol is the main cause uh, or some kind of a tapioca, some kind of uh, thing is being consumed uh, more in Germany? You know, is it we something are living like... in Europe. We are living in Europe, you know. Okay. There's a lot of beer in Germany <laughs> and uh, a lot of whiskey in the UK. So we are living in Europe and there's a lot of alcohol uh, and a lot of chronic pancreatitis. Okay. I can uh, ask you one more question here. It's from the audience that indications for pancreatic duct stenting across the pancreatic anastomosis or external drainage of the pancreatic no. anastomy. Your thoughts, please. No, we never we never do this. But uh, since we do robotic, uh, since that time we we use stents because the robot is such a disaster. You cannot see well, and then you have to put a stand in. So this is this is the answer. We never use a stand because it's not necessary. But for the robot to work, we we use stands. And when you see how the pancreatic anastomosis looks after a robotic reconstruction, you don't want to have this. So what we. We do it. We do it. We do it. We do it. But you do it only for the robotic weapons. You put it as stand. No, you know there's many, many people uh, that want a robotic whipple in Germany. Okay. And so then we offer we offer this, and I think the robot has some future. I'm. I also think so. Uh, and for the robotic anastomosis, we use a stand okay. for the robot. Okay. Okay. But okay. Not for uh, a standard anastomosis, never use a stent. I so, think those who are doing robotic whipples, they are telling that it is much easier than laparoscopic whipples. I think, uh, what's your comment on that? Manas, uh, I can take I mean, so I think the laparoscopic, the laparoscopic whipple is out after out. this... Uh, robotic. After this uh, control trial from... From leopard. the Netherlands, leopard, leopard, leopard trial. Okay. Yeah. They have built the laparoscopic whipple. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because my friend Pala Nivelo, he did it very well, but the the Dutch have killed this operation. But uh, you you finished three uh, whipple, open whipples during that time. You mean to say yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Uh, yes, uh, Alice, you are telling something. Uh, yeah. You are, Pala, you are telling something. I I tell you, I think. The robotic is the next step after the laparoscopic, and I see some role for the robotic surgery in the future. Yes. Yeah. So I think, Manas, I can tell you that the transition, at least from open surgery to robotic surgery, is more easier, at least as more far easier, as yeah. concerned. Because I, I have seen people laparoscopic who are not doing any kind of laparoscopic work have uh, transitioned from open to robotic so easily. It's Rather easy. than transiting from open to laparoscopy, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's simple. The ergonomics of the instruments and the wrist movements mimic what you do in open surgery. But okay. here, the cost is a huge problem. And the second thing is, have the patients to do a very good Whipple resection for 60 open operations. Be a good okay. master at that and then do another 80 of robotic to feel good as a robotic surgeon. So to be honest, Myself and Manish and Vikram, we are doing one or two robots uh, in 10 days. And okay. I really, but I'm in the learning curve. 
and okay. I'll show you nice videos of a beautiful pancreatic anastomosis. That we'll oh. be having another session for robotic weapons for sure. But, but, but it's one 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 one. One. Yeah. Yes, yes. But one one more because I saw this question how often the patients have diarrhea when you right. do a, a triangle. This is an important question because um, it is around 20% of the patients have diarrhea and some of them have ongoing diarrhea, but most of them have transition diarrhea. But I have to say that if you have never had diarrhea in your patients, you have never done the right Whipple. True. I think, True. And I think Absolutely. the second Absolutely. statement would be that if you don't have a Kyle leak, even then maybe you have not done a right Whipple. So yeah. I think both are important. You need to have some Kyle leaks and some diarrheas. Then you have yeah. done a but if, Whipple for sure. So how you avoid the Kyle leaks, Silas? Uh, what's your tech uh, for avoiding so, Kyle leaks? So just now I'm in dialogue with my two younger colleagues because I subconsciously feel, and I could be wrong, that mm -hmm. they have more Kyle leaks than I have. So they, of course, will say that they are doing a more cleaner and a radical job. And I will feel that I'm taking more care to avoid the Kyle leaks. I don't know the answer. But okay. I think whenever you think to answer the question more specifically, whenever you think that you are likely to cause a Kyle leak, and there are specific areas during the copper maneuver, the transverse mesocolon area, doing the uncinate first areas, uh, the bile duct areas are the typical areas where you get these chyle channels which are leaking and opening up afterwards. So when in doubt, I would clearly use more clips. When in doubt, I would take figure of eight proline five O sutures. Some of these sutures and clips may be a waste of time, but better to waste some time than have bad chyle leaks when otherwise the patient is fine. So I think those care, we try to take care. Also, when you do the cocker maneuver for SMA first, and you go to the left renal vein and the origin of the SMA, another classical area where you can run into trouble and open up our channels, which open up once the patient start to take a solid diet. So be careful in those areas so that you might minimize your Kyle leaks. Professor Bickler, have you ever thought of using a FJ in any of your vehicles? A feeding what? jejunostomy? A feeding jejunostomy, very, very rarely. Okay. Do you um, just advance the tube, uh, nasogestional tube, uh, across no, the efferent no, no. limb? No. Standard is no no gastric tube is standard. No gastric tube. Okay. And uh, feeding the patient as as soon as possible, so they drink the same day. They eat some soup or something at day one, and if they do not vomit, then they start eating more and. Uh, a tube to feed the patient very, very rarely. Um, I want to say only the ones that have uh, trouble, that have complications, that have reoperation, okay. then we put a feeding tube, otherwise not. Okay, Silas, so what about uh, your experience on this? We are putting a feeding tube. Um, we put a nasogeminal tube, but we are again uh, more and more of feeding from the same day of operation, not even the next day. If the patient can take it and if the patient wants it, we don't stop it for sure. And we keep it as a security. So if by day three, day four, uh, the patient is able to take by mouth and not showing signs of bad DGE, we take out the nasogeminal tube. So it's a backup plan. And we also don't do a feeding jejunostomy for last yeah. 17 years. And I, you must have heard me in many conferences talk about it. It's not proudly, but I must share this experience. I was a one-year consultant in Tata. I did a total gastrectomy. Everything healed well in this lady who was on bronchiolastomy and steroids. And I've done a feeding jejunostomy for a total gastrectomy. The esophageal anastomosis healed. The duodenal stump healed. The jejunostomy healed but the feeding jejunostomy leaked in this fat lady. She got complications, sepsis, and died. And then Professor Buchler, she died on day 40 odd. And then Professor Buchler told me that, Shailesh, why on earth do you do a feeding jejunostomy? I was discussing this case with him. And uh, he said, you just don't do, do a good anastomosis, 
and even if the patient is reasonably nutritionally good feed them by mouth and that has helped me for 17 years to more or less avoid a feeding jay but we do put a naso jejunal tube yeah i uh, think uh, that's also routine practice uh, we also follow naso jejunal tube we just advance to the efferent limb and uh, start to yeah. find uh, yes Manar, yes yes something? the problem of modern medicine and this is also true in surgery is that we do too much yes this is a big do it problem too much, yeah. so we put in tubes we put in peridural we put in urinary catheter we put in venous lines arterial lines and this is a big problem of modern medicine that we do too much i have i have experience with doing some whipples at other hospitals okay where they do not have this state of development okay and then they recover extremely well these patients absolutely Without absolutely anything. yeah i mean Because that's that's what, quite true that's quite whatever true whatever tube whatever tube you put into the patient this will cause some side effect i and i think it is finally the surgeon who decides the fate yes. and it's a surgery think, and the technique yes for example true, the true. epidural the epidural is it is getting us two days longer in the hospital so these these kind of things you have always to reflect what is good for the patient and what is good for the hospital and what is good for the anesthetist and i mean what is good for the patient we should do and we are doing by far too much because modern medicine modern medicine right right requires this and that's, we have that's, to be very careful that's absolutely true professor buckler uh, modern medicine we are doing overdoing things i think uh, if whipples is posted probably the anesthetist that take 45 minutes uh, to uh, intubate that put in all lines possible then is the patient is ready for surgery that's that's usual i, I mean you are yeah. quite true on that there is another question for professor from dr vani he says some inputs from you in case you have to explore for a pancreatic leak what is your general experience with pancreatic or jejunostomy leaks what you should do and what you should not do what are the do's and don'ts yeah so 90% of our leaks we we can manage uh with interventional drainage or something like that so let's say the the reoperation is very much at the end very much at the end so most of the leaks can be managed by an interventional drain plus antibiotic uh 90% 10% the patients become septic uh shilling and and all kind of uh blood pressure depression so yeah. intensive care needed these patients once in a while we reoperate and then and then it is always a difficult decision whether you just drain and suture or whether you take the pancreas out now if the pancreas is black such as post operative pancreatitis then we take it out if the pancreas is viable and we have a leak then we try to to get to keep the pancreas in by either just putting irrigation drains irrigation drains or or we get the anastomosis closed and put a drainage into the pancreas which is also an option uh to overcome the problem of leak and then rarely rarely we take the pancreas out but let's say from 100 leaks 90 we get managed by uh interventional uh management of the 10 we have to reoperate half of them we take the pancreas out the other half we do whatever is necessary to pre to preserve the pancreas 
So, Dr. Wadi, if I may add to what Professor has already said, we have done um, at least three, four times in the last five, six years a disconnection. So we retain the pancreas. The pancreas is viable. Uh, and then um, we put a stent or an infant feeding tube, a small tube in the duct and exteriorize the pancreas. And of course, we reset that segment of jejunum to the left of the common bile duct. So you safeguard the biliary and stomach anastomosis. You disconnect the pancreatic anastomosis, uh, put white drains and exteriorize it. And, um, and they can do well. And afterwards, you can always uh, again go in and do a neat pancreatic jejunostomy a few months later and patients can do well. And how and easier, you know, how easier you know, it is. Wait a minute, Manash. The yes. problem of this is, and we know this very well, is to get the tube in the pancreas sealed. The 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 bad thing of the pancreas is that after after a while the tube is no longer uh, no no longer uh, and then you have a leak which is very bad uh, or the tube is slipping out or the nurses uh, take the tube out or the patient takes the tube out so this is a very bad situation so we also do this what you say Shailesh but once in a while uh, this is not the solution yes because then you have another leak I agree with you I agree with you no, these so are I want to be on the safe side. If for whatever reason you uh, you cannot find a good solution, take the pancreas out. This is yeah. the the safest solution. So one question I only have for you: When you do a pancreas or try to take the pancreas out, do you have any problems sometimes with gastric vascularity? in a case where you have waited for a long time, POPFC, oh. bad pancreas, and then you do a completion pancreatectomy, which you might do bloody difficult, but possible and desirable. But at the end, uh, you realize that you have problems of the gastric remnant. Have you run into these situations? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Shailish, we have just finished this article uh, about uh, 600 total pancreatectomies where we check the gastric congestion yeah. and the venous ischemia because when you do a radical whipple and later a completion pancreatectomy then it can happen that you have no more venous drainage of the stomach just zero this was my point because you have cut the gastro epiploic you have cut the the coronary and there is no no more spleen so then there is no more vein so this can be a bad situation and then you can only cut the stomach back to one fifth one sixth one seventh one eighth to zero because there is no more uh, venous drainage so this is a a bad situation and in fact in germany Recently, they published an article in the Annals of Surgery that the overall mortality rate after total pancreatectomy in Germany is 21%. The overall hospital mortality for total pancreatectomy, including completion, exactly. is 21%. And much of this mortality is the venous congestion. And only few people know about this. Yeah. When I travel around and speak about venous congestion after total pancreatectomy, they look at me like I am from the moon. <laughs> so, I mean, that's this the, not a well known feature. No, I think you are such a world leader and authority. I wanted to bring this topic out for the purpose of the audience. Uh, I'm sure everybody's experienced, but I also see younger people here. And it's good to talk about theory and say that we do a total pancreatectomy. But when you, God forbid, land in a POPFC, I want this audience to know that get an experienced surgeon with you. The mind may not always work well if you're alone. And know 
option is an easy option but if you do a total pancreatectomy be aware of what the master is talking about venous congestion for the stomach beyond the total pancreatectomy job you have seen in my in my uh, lecture that you can reconstruct the coronary yes. vein yes. Yes. Not, in, not in the completion situation in the completion situation you cannot reconstruct any vein it's a mess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. so i think uh, we have completed almost all questions uh, from the chat are any other questions are there just have a look so dr nikhil suresh wants to visit heidelberg for a short fellowship to see the work in person of course you write to professor bukla and then sometime uh, once they get some time and corona gets under control uh, otherwise you will go in quarantine either in india or in germany so don't go now and then of course you can visit him sometime so everybody is most welcome to visit us i we we, we like our visitors because we can learn a lot from our visitors so you are welcome to visit us thank you professor bekler because many people will be interested to visit you and uh, see the tremendous volume of work and the quality of work that's been done so rudra you have any questions or any comments or suggestions no i just uh, had one question because i was with uh, goro for uh, some time in uh, tokyo so what it does is whenever uh, he has a venous uh, uh, congestion resect uh, vein or uh, he has to anastomose in all the vein parts he mobilizes the liver completely so i just wanted a opinion is it uh, always necessary uh, to mobilize the liver completely before going for the hippos no certainly not it's it, this is a big additional uh, time consuming so the i i only do this when when i have a long distance of portal vein to supermesenteric vein then it brings you one or two centimeters but only then i i i, I do this mobilization of the liver otherwise it's just not necessary Uh, otherwise it it comes in comfortably man, this man is probably a liver surgeon you visit yeah yeah yeah, so yeah, yeah. Guru, Guru is a liver surgeon yeah. mobilize the liver <laughs> so yeah. rudra rudra i think the important point is another thing about the portal vein anastomosis is that if it's it's a high pressure system and if you allow too much of kink or too much of laxity is also not good not so good correct breaking the liver down and mobilizing the colon and the small intestine when you have a gap of only so much you might actually create an angulation you want it to be straight so that's right. what i wrote to you in the reply that we mobilize maybe just a little bit falciform which you anyway have at the beginning of yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah and put a little pack or something during the actual anastomosis sometimes we need it otherwise you don't need it most of the time no yeah thank you thank you i think okay. uh, uh i must have done more than uh, 110 anastomosis uh, pj wow. all pj but uh, last 50 60 i am clearly following srikhand and uh, bukler and i am quite happy with it god bless you and your patients yeah i mean you are following the modified heidelberg technique then yeah 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 okay. it is 100% Thank i use 20 pds without any problem and yeah. uh, i do Thank it with uh, on the operation table i agree with you yeah, not yeah, yeah. you afterwards no 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 yeah. nothing it is table. on table you use everything and finish off that's yeah. all yeah. yeah okay fine i think uh, so i think we have uh, gone through all the questions uh, thank you very much professor bukler for accepting the request that's to right, come no. to yeah. this forum and give your excellent uh, discourse and whipples thank you silas for joining in it was a real pleasure to have both of you today evening it was a real learning for me and for many of our friends it was a win win situation for everybody so we really enjoyed the evening thank you very much thank you once again and we'll be happy to have you again sometime in some other format it will be a real pleasure uh, so prefer bikler uh, Uh, how you enjoyed the evening i mean your uh, end afternoon with us <laughs> <coughs>
I enjoyed very much. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. You, you are you. A very kind people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank bye you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Silas. Thank you very bye. much. Thank bye. you all the audience for joining. Good and night. keep joining next week, same time for total mesorectal excision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you, Manasuras. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.